everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to do a deep dive into 1850s fashions, looking at the subtle ways that women's fashion evolved from 1850 through 1859. I've decided to start with the 1850s, which is what I consider the mid-Victorian era, because I am currently making a reproduction of an 1859 fashion plate. If you haven't yet seen the first installment of that project, I'll leave a link to that video down below in the description. Please also leave me a comment and let me know if you like this deep dive style of video as I am planning to make this into a new series where we cover a different decade each month. Please feel free to also let me know which decade you'd like to see next. And if you like this video enough that you want to help support my channel, you can leave me a super thanks right below the video, which really helps me out, or I have linked my Patreon and my Ko-fi down in the description below. Anyway, for the most part, 1850s fashion as a whole saw some rather small changes that developed each year, but there were also two major changes that occurred in fashion in the 1850s that I want to mention right off the bat. First, the invention of the sewing machine. Now, there were a few variations of machines that performed a sewing action, which were patented and created in the 1830s and 40s. But what we think of today as a sewing machine with a vertical needle stemming off of a horizontal arm, a thread tensioning system, and a presser foot that held the fabric in place was patented by Isaac Merritt Singer in 1851. Several other inventors also patented adaptations of sewing machines throughout the 1850s, and sewing machines began to be sold commercially. This sped up the manufacturing of clothing, even though sewing machines were not actually marketed for home use until a decade or so later. Because clothing could be made more quickly, by the end of the decade, it tended to also involve more fabric and have a little bit more decoration than most dresses did in the 1840s or even earlier in the 1850s. The other big invention of the 1850s was the cage crinoline. The steel hooped cage crinoline was first patented in France in 1856 by R.C. Millier and then patented again in Britain in July of that year. By 1858, they had grown so popular that there were steel factories that exclusively made hoop steel to be used in the crinolines. The crinoline was actually incredibly liberating to women since women were no longer using several layers of petticoats to fill out their skirts and could instead support their large skirts with the cage crinoline and one or two additional petticoats. In the 1850s, these crinolines were made in a circular dome shape, but I will talk more about the evolution of the shape of the crinoline itself when I do the deep dive video on the 1860s. In any case, let's take a look at 1850s fashion. I'm going to be illustrating all of these changes with fashion plates, so do keep in mind that these are examples of the absolute height of fashion and not what most women wore in those years. In fact, it's entirely possible that many of these fashion plates were just never made into actual garments, or also possible that some of them may have been worn by extremely wealthy people in that year, but may not have had an effect on the general population until a few years down the line. All of these fashion plates can be found in the folder for their respective year within my crinoline era Pinterest board, which I have linked down in the description. In my opinion, fashions of the year 1850 can very easily be confused with the last few years of the 1840s. In 1850, it was all about soft. Soft shoulders, soft skirts, soft lines, and for the most part, even soft colors. Shoulders were very sloped, with the arm size sitting quite far off the shoulder. Sleeves were beginning to move toward that pagoda shape that the 1850s are so known for, but they hadn't really made it there yet. Instead, the sleeves were still tending towards a full length, with some a few inches shorter, and they widened through the length of the arm to the hem, where they ended in a gentle bell. This wider opening was often filled in by lace or by soft white undersleeves. For evening bodices, it was as if the bertha that is so common throughout the mid-Victorian era also served as the arm covering. There may have also been additional sleeves under there, but honestly, the berthas were so wide that they covered a good half of the upper arm anyway, and these berthas also sat very far off the shoulder, showcasing a woman's soft, sloped shoulders, or so the fashion plates hoped at least. The bodices were long, usually ending in a long point both for day and for evening, though the evening points were often longer than the day ones. 
Day bodices tended to look like wide V's, having an almost jacket-like opening up at the top and coming together as it neared the waist, with decoration to emphasize that V shape. Underneath the V, it was filled in with either soft white shirred fabric, likely part of the bodice, or by shirt-like garments that may have either been separate shirts or possibly chemisettes, or it could have been built right into the bodice. Jacket style bodices were also somewhat common, which would flare out over the hips like a large peplum. Sometimes for the jackets, they would start as that wide V at the shoulders, come together at the waist, and then open up with an upside down V below the waist. Other times though, they never even really met all the way in the middle. Skirts were full, but they appeared very soft. It is very easy to tell that these were filled out by many petticoats as opposed to hoops. Horizontal type trimmings were very popular, whether this took the form of multiple tiers of ruffles or rows of lace or other applied trims. I did in particular want to point out this plate from Le Moniture de la Mode, which uses a spiral tier that wraps itself over and over around the skirt. That must have been quite a challenge to actually make. I'm not really going to address accessories in this video, by the way, both because they can be pretty challenging to see in fashion plates, but also because instead I highly, highly recommend purchasing this very inexpensive book called Shoes, Hats, and Fashion Accessories, a Pictorial Archive, which is an amazing resource with at least one page on every year spanning 1850 through 1940. I've linked to it on Amazon down in the description because I truly believe that it is a must-have costuming resource. In 1851, we begin to lose some of that softness that was so pervasive in 1850. In fact, I would almost say that they were a bit inspired by men's tailoring in 1851, as that V-shape of the 1850s bodice has turned out much more suit-like in 1851. We also get some deeper non-pastel colors, like those that would be popular in men's suiting. The V openings on bodices get a little smaller, both shorter and narrower on the bodice, looking more like the opening of a suit, and the trimmings on them now tend to look more like lapels than just applied trim. We also begin to see some bodices that close up all the way in the front with a small white collar applied to the neck of the bodice. This type of neckline and collar would remain popular throughout much of the 1850s and 60s. All regular bodices still end in a point in the front, but points have become a little shorter, sharper, and narrower than they were the previous year. Jacket style bodices remain very popular as well. By autumn of 1851, sleeves on day bodices start to get a little bit shorter and a little wider of a bell at the hem, and they're now being filled in with fuller puffed white undersleeves. During the first part of the year, they're basically identical to those from 1850, though. On evening bodices, there's now some definition between the Bertha collar and short sleeves covered in ruffles. Skirts are just a little bit more full than they were in 1850, and while it's still very popular to have multiple tiers of ruffles or horizontal trimmings, plainer skirts also appear in many plates. 1852 seems to have decided that basically anything goes. Some bodices still have that V-shaped opening at the front, while others close all the way up to the neck. Some bodices have pointed waists, while others seem to be nearly flat at the waist, and there are others that have odd decorations applied to the waist instead. Though that being said, the jacket bodice really begins to take off in 1852, with the majority of day bodices now having some sort of peplum below the waist. Sleeves are all over the place as well, with some sleeves back to their 1850 proportions, some with that wider bell from autumn of 1851, and I actually found at least one example of a fully fitted sleeve. Evening gown sleeves, though, have gotten shorter than they were in the previous two years. Skirts have about the same fullness as in 1851, the majority of which have tiers of horizontal ruffles. Colors are relatively similar to those in 1851, with a few brighter pops of color thrown in, such as a brighter pink or bolder yellow. Pink, though, really seemed to be the color of the year in 1853, appearing all over fashion plates for both day and evening. In general, brighter colors were more popular this year than they had been earlier in the decade. However, this was still before aniline dyes were invented, which happened in 1856, so the bright colors were things like Pepto-Bismol pink, blue, green, yellow, and even purple. 
1853, the jacket bodice made up nearly all day bodices, with pointed bodices really just reserved for evening wear. These jacket bodices would either close up all the way to the neck, or they would have a shallow v-neck, most of which was filled in by ruffles. The faux jacket was also somewhat popular, where there would be a very narrow v-shaped gap bridged by a series of bows or other trim with an underlayer that looked kind of like a shirt, but was almost assuredly attached to the bodice. These bodices could also have that sort of open gap echoed on the sleeves. Sleeve shapes in general tended to be longer and less bell-like, almost reverting back to the shape of the 1850s sleeve. Evening sleeves were longer than the previous year, with that length usually coming from a little white puff that stuck out beneath the bertha and other applied ruffled decorations. Skirts were slightly less voluminous that year, reverting back to something that was slightly more full than 1850, but less full than 1851. However, that skirt fullness really came back with a bang in 1854. Skirts were so full this year that it is very easy to see why someone may have started to work on inventing a steel support structure. I honestly can't imagine how many petticoats were needed to fill out a skirt in 1854, but it must have been a ton. Tiered ruffled skirts were nearly ubiquitous. Bodices, on the other hand, were basically the same as they were in 1853, though the high closed neckline had definitely become the most popular. While day sleeves also remained the same as the previous year, evening sleeves once again lengthened just a little bit from the year prior. In 1855, the idea that those skirts were being held out with just petticoats alone and no solid support structure underneath was honestly ridiculous. If you thought skirts were full in 1854, you had another thing coming. In fact, if you are actually able to recreate this humongous skirt fullness without the use of a hoop skirt, please take a little video of how you do it and send it to me on Instagram, which is at Lady Rebecca Fashions, because I literally cannot fathom how they achieved this bell shape without a cage crinoline or hoop skirt underneath. Again, horizontal tiers of ruffles appeared on the majority of skirts, but some skirts also start to use vertical and zigzag trims, either in addition to or instead of the ruffled tiers. The jacket bodice with its little flared peplum was apparently the only type of bodice worn in 1855, some of which had the same high neckline, but some of which had a lower square neckline, mostly filled in with ruffles or lace. Diagonal bands of trimming set wide on the shoulders and coming nearer together at the waist were very popular starting in 1855. If you saw my video from last week where I examined the antique 1860s bodice that may have been remade from an 1850s bodice, that is what that random trim piece that went with the bodice would have been used for. I'll link that video down below in case you haven't watched it yet. Ball gown bodice sleeves went back to a shorter length and day bodice sleeves also shortened a little bit and flared out into a fairly large bell by the hem, larger even than those seen in autumn of 1851. As I mentioned at the start of this video, in 1856 the cage crinoline was patented. I would be very interested to know if an enormous skirt such as this roughly lace confection from La Mode Parisienne, published in June, was meant to be worn over the cage crinoline, which was patented in France in April, or if they expected mere petticoats to fill it out. Bodices remained pretty close to those in 1855, though the square neckline seems to have fallen out of favor to be replaced instead by a wide boat-shaped one, which was filled in with ruffles or ruched white cotton. However, the high-necked bodice remained the most popular by far. The jacket bodice peplums do seem to have grown a little bit longer this year, so that when they're worn with a tier ruffled skirt, they almost act as if they are the top tier of the skirt. Sleeve hems have belled out even wider on day bodices, and evening bodice sleeves have lengthened once again. In general, by the middle of the decade, dresses also seem to have a lot more applied trim than they did at the start of the decade. Possibly that's because of the recent spread of the sewing machine, or maybe it's just because the dresses were larger, presenting way more space on which to apply the trim. It's hard to say. By 1857, the cage crinoline was in widespread use. 
The odd thing though is that skirts this year actually seem to be smaller than they were in 1855 and 1856, which makes very little sense to me. The tiered ruffled skirt was still the most popular, but other trim configurations were really popping up as well. Particularly popular was one that had a couple of contrasting vertical panels on either side of the front of the skirt. While the jacket bodice style was still by far the most popular, pointed bodices also started to resurface. For jacket bodices, the peplums could be nearly any length, from quite short to basically half of the skirt length. Sleeve bells continue to be extremely wide, filled with large puffs of white cotton undersleeves. By the way, these undersleeves would actually tie in to the inside of the oversleeves so they could be easily removed to be laundered. Ball gown bodice sleeve length varied from the shorter style of a few years prior to the longer styles of the year before. In 1858, skirt widths ballooned once again, and for the first time in several years, the tiered ruffled skirt was no longer the most popular. Instead, a two-tiered skirt was very prevalent, with a long layer underneath and then a shorter layer over the top, though these were not usually ruffled layers. Often, the top layer would be pulled up in various places or would actually be slit open to reveal more of the bottom layer in certain parts of the skirt. Some of these top layers were actually part of the bodice, whether that was like a long jacket bodice that was cut in one with no waist seam, such as this fashion plate from Le Monitua de Mode in February 1858, or sometimes they appeared to be skirts that were attached to a pointed bodice, like this pastel plaid confection from Le Bon Ton in April. As you can also see from this plate, the filled-in squared neckline was back in style, along with the filled-in boat neck that had been popular the year before. Matching pelerines, or Sontag-style wraps, were also popular ways to fill in this wide boat neckline. The high neckline remained popular, of course, as well. The pointed bodice was once again quite popular, edging out the jacket bodice, and the wide bell sleeves became, if possible, even larger. However, other sleeve shapes were starting to show up by the end of the year as well, such as these fitted sleeves from Magazine de Demoiselle in November, or these large full sleeves that gathered down at the wrist from Le Bon Ton also in November. Ball gown sleeves, though, remained relatively the same, though sometimes fancy sheer hanging sleeves were also present on ball gowns. We have reached the final year of this video, 1859, which is also the year of the fashion plate that I'm currently working on and what inspired this whole deep dive. Fashion in 1859 was much the same as 1858, but with bigger sleeves and more trimming. The high-necked day bodice had taken back over, hanging sleeves started to be a thing on day bodices as well as evening, and ruffled tiered skirts had come back in style, along with those two tier skirts from the previous year. We're ending out the decade as veritable cupcakes, covered with flounces and furbelows, and consisting of yards upon yards of fabric, far more than would have been required to make a dress in 1850. Frankly, although it feels like only very subtle changes happened year by year, when you look at a plate from 1850 side by side with a plate from 1859, they sure are quite different. So anyway, I hope you have enjoyed this deep dive into the 1850s. Did you learn anything you didn't know before? Or did you have a favorite fashion plate? Please let me know down in the comments. Also, do let me know which decade you'd like to see me do next. Personally, I was thinking of doing the 1860s so that we could just continue this cage crinoline evolution. And if you are interested in watching some broader fashion evolutions, such as the change of undergarments or of dress styles throughout the 1800s, I will leave links to some additional videos that I've made in the past down in the description. If you like this video though, please make sure to click the thumbs up icon, and if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please be sure to click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week, with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram, so please go follow me on Instagram, that's at LadyRebeccaFashions. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi down in the description below, or you can send me a super thanks right here on YouTube. 
I'd also like to give a special shout out to my Edwardian level patrons, Sharon and Mirage. Thank you all so, so much for joining me today. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!